Sherry Arison, and here uh, with us is uh, Jonathan Harrison, The Path to Enlightenment and Inner Peace. Hi, Jonathan. How are you? I'm well, thanks, Sherry. Um, welcome. Good, good to meet you. Good to meet you, too. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about yourself. We just met. This is our first time, so I would love to hear all about you. Um, anything specifically? Well, first of all, before we get into the spiritual spirituality, maybe you can tell me about yourself in general. I've lived in this country uh, in Israel since 1969. Okay. I was born in Manchester. Okay. In England. In Do you Northern go back England. to England often? Occasionally. Okay. I'm a sister there. Uh, in Manchester, there is not only football teams, there's also a town there, <laughs> which is where I lived. Great. So I grew up there, went to school there. I studied in Scotland. Okay. I studied physics and mathematics in Scotland for seven years in Edinburgh. And what made you come to Israel? I'm a Jew, you know. At the time, I was Zionist, and I was religious, and I was also... You say I was, so... Yeah, yeah, and I was... Okay. Um, and, well, with age, you know, these sort of uh, extreme emotions sort of tend to level out a little bit, and you, yeah. you, I think you see things maybe a little bit more in proportion. I agree. And I was also working in defense industries, and uh, just after the 67 war here, when there's a huge euphoria in the country because nobody knew what was waiting for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we still don't know what's waiting no. for us. We can just wish for the best. And uh, I think uh, Charles de Gaulle in France embargoed, uh, put an embargo in Israel for all the spare parts for the Mirage planes, which were the backbone of the Air Force. And basically, in a sense, he created the local aerospace industry because we had no choice. So they recruited uh, engineers and scientists from all over the world. I didn't know that. But I remember reaching the Jewish agency in London, which uh, I understood was the place which, where people were trying to help Jews to get to Israel. And they said, uh, you know, why do you want to go to Israel, the girl said there. Because she'd only just got a posting in London. She couldn't understand why anybody's sane who want to go to this uh, crazy country. So, yeah, it's funny. I'm from the States, and people say to me the same thing. Right. <laughs> yeah. So um, she said, there's no work. What do you do anyway? I said, I work in aerospace. She said, oh, there's no work for you there. I said, so who does, you know, all these uh, miracle things we read about in the press? She says, I don't know. I just work here. So that was my first taste of Israeli bureaucracy. Wow. That was really encouraging. And uh, so I said, you know, give me a trade director and I'll find myself a job. I said, I don't mind, in, you know, housing I'll, I'll work out, but I have to have a job because I have a young wife and a, a, a five-month-old baby. And uh, so I have to have an income. That's, uh, that's That makes me nervous. So. Did you know Hebrew at the time? No. Okay. I knew the word shalom. Okay. <laughs> and, so very uh, brave. Okay. Yes, well, or stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea what I was going to. And uh, so I looked through. She gave me down on Bradstreet, which was completely useless. It was all financial information. didn't help me uh, much. And then I said, you know, I don't know what to do. So she said, well, there you are then. He says, no work for you there. He says, actually, there is one one idea I have. So an idea from a seemed already a change. I said, well, that's just, well, you could go to the embassy and talk to this uh, Colonel Rimon in the military attaché. You know, who knows? So uh, I turned up next day at the Israeli embassy, got through all the guards and everything, and was shown to this kind of hut thing at the back. And I was halfway there, and this uh, this guy came out dressed in full, you know, military yeah. outfit with all his medals here and everything. You know, he said, good morning, Mr. Harrison. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to come in. So I went in, you know, sat down, and he said, "Okay." He says, "I understand you want to go live in Israel, and you you need work." I said, "Yeah." He says, "What do you do?" I said, uh, "I work in aerospace in uh, um, flight vehicle wind tunnel testing." So he went the door, locked it pulled the key out, pulled out a sheaf of paper and said, sign here, you have a job wow. in defense uh, industries. And I said, you know, but at the end, at the embassy, at the, what do you got, the Jewish agents, there's no work for me. So that they know nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so that's when I was introduced to Israel. Wow. And from that, you got into spirituality. When did that happen? I was a development. I, were, uh, I did a lot of things. I was, uh, I was very interested in science and the fundamentals of science. And my training in physics has probably been the most useful thing in this so-called spiritual work. Because for me, spirituality is just about learning to be more realistic, seeing things as they really are, 
rather than as I think they are, you see, mm -hmm. seeing the real world, this, you see. So. I, I so agree with you. And it's funny, a lot of people think that, you know, science and physics are completely different from spirituality. And I always <laughs> say it's one of the same. Mm. If you understand it deeply, I think it's all mathematics, really, and geometry. So, so true. Yes. Yeah. So I was a magician for many years, magic. Oh, wow. And magic is also playing with this um, on the boundaries of um, what's real and how it looks, you see, because a magician isn't surprised when the elephant disappears because he knows where the elephant was. He knows where it is now. And he knows exactly what happened, you see. But the audience is, oh, you know. Yeah. Because, How did and, you do that? <laughs> right. And the only difference between them, the elephant's in the same place in both cases. The only difference is in their perception. So they're not, people are responding emotionally. The magician doesn't really respond at all. He maybe acts, he responds, he's surprised. But in reality, he knows exactly, because he has a knowledge and the audience doesn't. They believe it's in the cage or whatever, and here it's gone. So the only difference between them is their perception. So if you understand that we react from magic, magic is about 95% acting and psychology. You know, if I put a, a coin here and vanishes, the, the uh, strength of the uh, trick depends on how well I've convinced you that the coin is really here. Mm -hmm. So that I, I began to understand that we react not to what's happening, but what to what we think is happening. Exactly. And that was very interesting. So and you're also a musician, right? I, uh, yeah, for many, many years. You know, I, what do you play? I played, well, I played guitar and I was a singer. I had actually an Israeli um, song group in Edinburgh. Oh, really? I didn't understand any of the words, but I enjoyed it. And that was part of the Zionism, you see. And, uh, and I played double bass in a, in a college uh, modern jazz group. And, uh, because I think that music also fits into spirituality. Because if you think of uh, vibration, um, you know, and tuning, you know, the tuning into yourself and tuning into others mm. has a lot to play. Yeah, resonating. Um, yes, resonating. Yeah. How true. Um, you know, when when we hear music, you know, people have a reaction in their body. They, uh, you can feel sad or happy or depending on how the notes hit your body. And I think that mm. has a lot to do with the frequency as well. How do you see that? Well, I started studying, uh, I started studying guitar when I was about 14. And at the same time, or 15, I was studying in a high school. Uh, or Yeah, I began studying uh, in physics the theory of the vibrating string. Oh, wow. So I, I studied it at school, the math. And then at home I played it, and I, I saw that, that, you know, they just merged. They were just one. So that was another interesting area. So how did you get into Buddhism? Uh, it's all a mistake, really. <laughs> you know, there are no mistakes, but <laughs> there's a, well, everything well, happens as it should. At least well, that's what I believe. <laughs> you obviously know where this conversation is going, <laughs> so I have to trust you. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I did my stint of psychotherapy for a while, you know, at the age of 30. Okay. And um, so that was interesting because... So were you still in, air, you were in aerospace and then went to study uh, psychotherapy? How did that no, work? No, 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 I didn't study it. I was in psychotherapy, I was in therapy. Oh, you were, yourself yeah, yeah, were in therapy. The okay. Which was fascinating. Okay. Because whether you call it spirituality or psychotherapy or self-help or whatever, you know, awareness is awareness is awareness. So exactly. I don't really care where it comes from. Exactly. So they all contributed. And then um, we had a very good friend, a psychologist. I, uh, she's still a friend. Uh, she's been a friend 50 years. We met when she was studying in London. And um, she said to me, there's some lectures in Tel Aviv with this guy, uh, Yanka Liraz and Nachia. Uh, yes, I know Yanka Liraz. They're doing this thing on psychology and Buddhism. So I said, okay, enjoy it, you know. She said, uh, I said, what's Buddhism anyway? She says, I don't know, but it's, they're very good. I said, well, you know, no, you have to come. So I said, no, you know, it's not, it's not my kind of thing. It's not, I don't know. I know nothing about psychology as an academic and even less about Buddhism. No, she said. So we argued and anyway, I didn't go. So the first semester ended and the second semester started and she said, um, you know, it's not, not, nothing you can do about it. You're going to have to come. So I don't know how, but I ended up there. And uh, they were, they're very good. I mean, Yanka Deraz is an incredible lecturer. 
And Nachi Alon has got a very good heart, and he's, I think, very, very, very good two guys. Okay. And between them, it was a bit like a sort of, you know, two stand-up guys, but they, <laughs> they did their stuff, and they were very, very good. And, and this was a whole semester? This was, yeah, I suppose so. It was a few months, and uh, it was very interesting. And um, during this time, somewhere, a neighbor of ours, who was a very kind of spiritual person, uh, handed my wife this flyer for this uh, session in uh, Gash, which is a kibbutz just north of Herzliya. Um, she it's said for that, anybody who's listening, it's really uh, north of Tel Aviv. North of Tel Aviv. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Not everybody knows. Um, so yeah. you see how good my geography is. <laughs> so um, she said, "Look, it's not my kind of stuff," but um, she gave to my wife. She said, "But." You know, Jonathan might be interested. So I don't know how, I don't know why, but, you know, I ended up there. There was this room, and uh, Dr. Peter Fenner was there, an Australian philosopher. And I sat down, and there were about 50 people there, beautiful room with a big glass window at the end overlooking the sea, beautiful place, you know. And nothing happened. So, you know, after about 20 minutes, I was getting very uncomfortable, sweating a bit, you know, you know. When you say nothing happened, it was just quiet in the room? Yeah, well, Peter was there, you know, and he was making, you know, eye contact with people and, uh, you know, smiling here and there. And he was very, it wasn't that he was cut off or dissociated or anything. He was very much there. But in but my he terms, wasn't doing. nothing he was... special was happening, you know, so I wonder when it was going to start. And it took me several years before I'd understood fully that Peter wasn't doing anything because... From his point of view, there was nothing special that needed doing. <laughs> that's great. And so it's very, very simple, you see. And uh, that makes people very uncomfortable usually. Very, me, it was terrible. Um, yeah. You know, I was, it was really, really bad. You know, I think I asked the first question out of anxiety. My anxiety went sky high. I didn't know what, what was going on. And um, then sometime he said uh, during the he said. You can consider this work in, a, in his strong Australian, Australian accent. He said, you might consider this work as a variation on Zogchen. So that sort of... What does that mean? Explain. I don't know. I, <laughs> so I went to him in a coffee, the coffee break. And it was very, very um, informal, the whole thing. It wasn't clear when you could go out, when you could come in. The, he explained at one point that he said, he said for me... There is no preference between in this work between silence and between conversation. That was also pretty strange. And from all these things I'd heard about meditation and Aum kind of stuff, you know. And so, I, you know, I really, it was very, very, very weird. It was very strange. So I went up to But him it and did said, catch uh, your eye, something. obviously. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for pointing that out because there was something in the air. And I don't want to get mystical about it or anything, but I mean, I could sense something there in the air which felt right to me, and I wanted more of it. Now, if you ask me what it was, I really don't have any words for it. But energy, a certain energy. If you want, yeah, well, whatever. Okay. Um, but I knew, I knew that, you know, I wanted it, whatever it was. And uh, so I went to him in the coffee break, and I said, excuse me, Peter, am I disturbing you? And he said to me, and I remember, I remember this, you see, tens of years later, he said, you couldn't disturb me, even if you tried. And I was really offended, you know, really upset by that, taking the back. It took me several years to understand that what he meant was that I didn't have the power in me to upset him, that the sentence didn't mean anything. I behaved as I behaved. If he got upset... It was his upset. It was his upset. Exactly. I, but I didn't understand anything that at the time. I just felt he was, a, you know, was a push-off. Wow. So I said to him, well, I just want to ask you a question, um, you said this was Zogchen or something? What is that? So then he explained to me it was one of the two Tibetan non-dual streams, Buddhist streams. In fact, there were even periods when some of the, some of the Buddhists didn't, re, weren't, didn't agree that it was kind of part of Buddhism. And uh, later I understood from him that although Buddhism is solidly based on a non-dual understanding, that most Buddhists don't know it. Just the same as most Jews don't know Kabbalah, and most right. Arabs or Muslims don't know Sufism, which right. is, let's say, the spiritual, the, mystical, side of, right. the spiritual side of the religion. 
and they're too much maybe occupied with the ritual, which can lose its uh, its content. So that. is that the type of Buddhism that you teach? Uh, well, the truth is I'm not, over the years, I've come to a place where I'm not really in favor of importing foreign uh, cultures. Okay. You know, that's fine for the Tibetans. Uh, Dzogchen flows very naturally from uh, Tibetan Tantra. Okay. Which is uh, different from Indian Tantra, although they're related. But, you know, it's fine for the Tibetans. There's a huge amount of uh, guided visualization in it, which the Tibetans are apparently very good at. I'm terrible at it. I can't visualize things. So, you know, it, it didn't feel to me relevant here. I mean, in this country, which is where I was going to be doing most of my teaching, I have students in the States and other places, you know, through video. Through video? video call. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I te yeah, teach groups and individuals. But, you know, majority, almost all my teaching is here. So what do you call your, your course or what you teach? That's a very good question because uh, the places I teach and I myself – I haven't yet managed to find a good name for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but if you go, if you call out to people to join a certain well, yeah, class yeah, we, or... We invent names for what? it, like uh, Clear Mind and... Uh, okay. And my book is called, uh, in English it's called... Oh, uh, we'll get to your um, book. This is your is book. Called, Ending, Ending Stress. Stress. That's what the marketing people said. And it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, I understand got, it's a bestseller here in Israel. And it's, the Israeli uh, version is, yeah. Yes, and uh, and this is being sold on Amazon, correct? Yeah. And so if hoping, anybody's interested, they can uh, get a copy <laughs> okay. of your book. And what I'm hoping is when the second book comes out, the second book is actually being is in translation now. I've okay. written it. And it's the same work, but it's uh, solidly uh, based in interpersonal communication. Okay. Which is one of the areas we seem to have the most trouble I totally agree. People, I totally agree. With other people. I always say that most of the problems in the world is that. It's communication. It seems to it's, be. It, you know, it's how we communicate with ourselves mm. and then how we communicate with each other. All right. Um, I've forgotten his name, but I quote him in the second book, uh, which at the moment is going through a series of titles, but at the moment it's called uh, When Barriers Dissolve, When Boundaries Dissolve. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. And um, there was an American journalist whose name I've forgotten at the moment um, who said that the central problem with communication is the illusion that it happened. <laughs> yeah, I can understand that. Because so, we what we think we're communicating is not exactly what a, someone else absolutely, is receiving. Absolutely. Um, and that's where lies all the misunderstandings mm. and... You know, where our ego gets uh, yeah. bent out of shape and so on and so forth. Absolutely. Um, so in what way do you teach? Is it a, is, is, <laughs> Do you lecture? Do you have no. an ongoing course? Uh, I, explain I, I, a little I bit more courses. about that. You teach courses. Uh, How long is a course? Well, I have a um, couple of courses I teach in Omata Shon. Okay. At the Israel Mind Body Center. Okay. A lot of kind of these, do a lot of this kind of stuff. And you said you do courses online. I do courses. I don't do courses online, but I teach one-on-one uh, -on -one and to groups. Okay. Uh, so Either in Hebrew or in English? In, uh, yeah. Both. Okay. Both languages? I have, yeah. Any other languages? There are Israelis. I have, at the moment, not. I have, I'm very bad with languages. I, okay. It's bad enough for me to get my hands around Hebrew. When I landed in this country and I got off the plane, I realized it's stolen my language. <laughs> I, I was naive beyond anything you can imagine. Yeah. And uh, that was terrible. It took me years and years. That, that actually reminds me of that story as to how I found out the way to learn Hebrew, which was in New York. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. How did you find out how to learn Hebrew in New York? Well, I was with a young engineer, a guy called Meir. And we had $18 million in our pockets, as it were, from the defense people. Okay. And I was going to build a, uh, a flight test center, which was the first one in the country. Okay. Uh, it is an aircraft. So that we could find out what was happening to a, a, an, a, an aircraft in flight test before the pilot knew even. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you know, with screens, NASA style, a bit smaller, you know, screens and computers. And uh, I was looking for equipment which was powerful enough to do that. So with $18 million in your pocket, even in the States, you know, the salesman interested because there may be a million dollars for them in their pocket. So 
it wakes some level of interest still. Okay. So how did you get to Hebrew? Well, I was at the time, I was sort of a very, very orthodox religious Jew, but that's, that's another part of the story. I, yeah. I had ten We're not going to have time for that. No. <laughs> I had 10 years of, uh, with a black skull cap and Oh, beard, wow. And, you know, very religious. Okay. The whole, the whole uniform. Okay. I even used to take off my glasses in the bus so that I wouldn't see the women and come to, God forbid, bad thoughts. And once I missed my bus stop, I had to walk three stops back. Wow. So you so, so what's more interesting to me right now is how you <laughs> created major change within yourself. I don't know. Oh, obviously. Obviously. So it just happened. It just I evolved. No, I have I suppose so. I, I really have no idea. So it Maybe wasn't... started with my grandmother's grandmother's genes. I, I really I don't know I don't know how these things happen. More and more as I get older, I less and less know how things happen. And that for me is a fundamental of all this work. So uh, back to your course, um, how long is the course? Well, I have a course for beginners, which is eight lessons, okay. which doesn't require any previous training. People come off the streets into that course. Okay. Um, surprisingly, at the end of the eight lessons, around half of them start understanding it, which surprises me because it's kind of, it's not complicated, but it's very subtle, this, this stuff. So what does it actually mean? For somebody who goes into your course and comes out of your course, right. are they calmer? Are they healthier? Are they more aware? How, maybe, how would you define it? Maybe a little bit, although it takes years of training. Um, it, for, it's just a sort of taste. Okay. For, I mean, you know, I'm hoping that they'll go on working with themselves, and but we've sown the seeds that the course doesn't, this doesn't create enlightenment or you know anything like that. Yeah. My own teacher says that there's two stages to gaining enlightenment. The first stage is understanding there is no such thing. And the sec then it turns out the second stage is unnecessary. <laughs> so that's uh, close to what I teach. Yeah. But I have a second course, um, which is 18 or 20 lessons, okay. which is uh, in-depth and also begins to relate to this interpersonal uh, Communication, yeah. okay. For example, that the, for me, just as you said, that the main thing preventing from my point of view, from preventing me from seeing you is my knowledge of you. So that... Um, because we don't really see each other. We no. see what we perceive of each other. Absolutely. Which is very different. You see. So you will not understand many of my reactions because my reactions are flowing from my own psychological conditioning. Right. But you're not party to that. You're party to yours, maybe. Right. Even, even all yours you don't remember fully. But you certainly don't know mine. So you... You know, you may be disturbed by some of my reactions because they, they seem irrelevant. They are irrelevant to what's happening now. But they're not irrelevant in the context of my past. But you don't know about my past. So we, that, you know, we understand the same words differently. So, so you teach people to look beyond that? Mm, absolutely. That, okay. As it were, it's only a metaphor. It's not really like this. But if you're speaking to me or if you're just there not speaking to me because a lot of communication through body language and other subliminal signs um can as it were jump over or take a leap over the sort of on the surface communication to find out where's this coming from what's in your heart what's what ex what are you experiencing which is never accessible to me but maybe it's a little bit but I think people that are sensitive can, you know, I always say that if you can feel someone's vibration, you know, somebody could say to me, uh, oh, everything's wonderful. And, and you could feel that it's not really Absolutely, the yeah. case. Yeah. So I think it's a matter of also uh, becoming more sensitive mm. to the underlying uh, communication, Absolutely. which that's, is that's much more... Work. That's so the whole work. Okay. My, my courses are irrelevant for you. <laughs> you, you should come and guest teacher. You should teach them. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, the, and in, is there a practice? Do you do you, people well, who leave the course do they leave is, with um, a certain practice? Normally, we, we the practice is like this. There, it was described by the sort of Tibetan founder of uh, Dzogchen, who was Garab Dorje, lived in the ninth century. He described three, only three points which he said touch the essentials. First, somebody introduces you to your real nature. Okay. Usually that's a, a teacher. But it may be, you know, child crying in the street or a flower, you know, moment of understanding. But usually it's a, it's a teacher who's already there, usually. Secondly, you grasp this essential point. Because one thing somebody introduces you is another thing that you get it, that the penny drops. And the third stage is that you proceed with complete confidence towards a result, or in modern terminology, you look at it, you're introduced over and over and over again, 
and it begins to stabilize you know you, your brain begins to understand what you're trying to tell it and so the only difference is that you 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 stop believing what you think in any absolute sense i think the second uh part that you talked about um where you sort of kind of get it i think a lot of times that's something that we go over and over and over like mm. in a you know a spiral of you know coming back to the same kind of situation and understanding it each time on a deeper level absolutely exactly that yeah so this work is really just encouraging that process so the only uh, exercise that i really offer or recommend or invite my students to is to touch this space which i call the unconditioned mind the mind that sees reality as it is with no intervention from thoughts. In fact, the thoughts become part of reality. You just watch mm. the thoughts as they come, they yeah. appear, they go, and they're just part of, they're just another phenomenon, like clouds or a bird might arrive. I, I always say it's almost, it's like a, you know, seeing something on a computer or, yeah. you know, just, just understanding that it's... Yeah, it's just ephemeral. Not, yeah, yeah, exactly. So then the thoughts become part of them. So and the, the emotions as well, yeah. and the emotions, and the feelings, sensations. Your but, whole experience, you know, right. it's, just, it's a changing, fluid thing. You can't get hold of it. Right. And uh, so in the unconditioned mind, uh, the only real essential difference may be that I no longer believe what I think in any absolute sense. And and people who read the book, and I'm, I can't wait to read the book. Thank, <laughs> thank you for it. Um, it says ending stress. Um, yeah. Do you have in the bo- book tools to really Absolutely. come to a Absolutely. more It's realistic? not so much tools, it's just understanding. Okay. You see, uh, as you understand things, for example, uh, there's an old Buddhist story um, of a man that got hit by a stick. You probably know it. No. And he started shouting at the stick. So these people said to him, you know, that's crazy. The stick's just a piece of wood. You, you can't blame a stick. He, he said, blame the hand that's holding the stick. He said, you're right. He started screaming at the hand. He said, what an idiot. I didn't mean it like that, you know, literally. You gotta, if you want to be angry with anybody, be angry at, you know, the person whose hand it is. He said, you're right. He started screaming at this, this man, you see. And he said, no, 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 no. What about all the things that brought him to be as he is and to do this? And then you're lost. It's the whole world, you see. It's maybe the Big Bang and the creation of the solar system and the fact his grandmother was born and he has this particular genetic mix. And you see, so you're looking at the tip of the iceberg you, and he's the visible sign of the maybe aggressive act, but he's just part of the whole, you see. So when you realize that, then, you know, as much as you'd like to be angry, you know, I can't find anybody, I can't identify clearly anybody to be angry with because I don't know who's controlling this. And then it, the whole thing just begins to dissolve, as it were, out of desperation. You so, you see, I've got this anger, and I begin to realize that, you know, it's me. I, I have a tendency to be angry. Now, for me, it's easier to feel that I'm an angry person in, ten, in terms of my personality than I live in a, in a very aggressive, hostile world, you see, because this I can maybe deal with a bit, you see. There's actually a Buddhist fable about that too, about somebody who finds himself barefoot in a, thorn, a field of thorns. So there's two solutions. Cover the field with leather or put in a pair of shoes. <laughs> the second solution is cheaper. So yeah. something like so if Great I deal stories. with me, I've dealt with everything. I agree. I once remember that my teacher said to me, Peter Fenner said to me, if you want to double the number of students you have, find something inside you to double. Mm. I can't say I understood him fully at the time, but uh, I see it very much how the world seems to reflect a lot the way we perceive. We we find that, you know, we create a, a marriage which reflects and we create Everything, and we everything find reflects the yeah. everything. You know, we say here at uh, Essence of Life that in order to reach world peace, we need to reach our own peace individually. And that's exactly that. I mean, if you, whatever you change within yourself, you're changing the whole world. Yeah, maybe, maybe in that sense, the uh, biggest contribution you have to the world is a little bit of sanity. And then there's a bit, one more, slightly more one sane. One more sane person. And it's, it's, not a, it's not a common... Uh, thing yeah. to find so it's probably yeah. significant well um we're close to the end so okay. <laughs> what i'd like to ask you is if you have for the listeners for the viewers one tip that could help them yeah but it's i'm afraid it's not original actually nothing that teaches original okay um 
It might be original to whoever's listening. Maybe. There's a, um, there's a, I saw, a, um, I quoted it also in the second book, um, there's an English film producer, movie producer, who went to find the vanishing Buddha. And he, there's a whole, he made a movie, a documentary, and he searched all over Japan and other places. And finally he met this Zen master. And he thanked him very much for the time. And he was in his robes, you know, the whole thing. And he sat there and he said, uh, a little bit like your question, he said, um, if it's possible, maybe it's a dumb question, but is it possible to sort of summarize what is Zen really? What's the essence of all this work? What, what, what's the most important person, thing for a person to do? So Zen must have thought for a moment. He said, to know himself. I can't really think of much improvement over that. That's what I so always say. The that's second amazing. possibility of calling the second book is yeah. know yourself, find friends. Uh, but that's uh, a book I'm writing, but that's okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jonathan Harrison. Thank you. It's good to meet you. Good to meet you too. Thank you.